Now, I want to talk about some sad news today as well. Um, yesterday, we learned that the remains of 215 children were found in a mass grave at the site of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School, which operated until 1978. I want to remind the audience that more than 150,000 children were taken to residential schools. And in 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission called this practice a cultural genocide against indigenous peoples. I know that people across the country are hurting from this terrible news, so I want us to have a moment of silence for these 215 children and for everyone who has been impacted by their deaths. So in light of this, today's event feels particularly important um, because we're here to celebrate the publication of a new book called Nishka, which is a meditation about the legacies of Canada's residential school system and its ongoing effects on contemporary Indigenous existence. And so on that note, I'm excited to introduce today's speakers who are experts on this topic and some of the most celebrated poets that we have in, in our community. So Jordan, Billy Ray, can you please join me on stage? Hello. Hello. Nice to see you both. Jordan Abel is a Niska writer from Vancouver. He is the author of The Place of Scraps, which won the Dorothy Lipsy Poetry Prize, Uninhabited, and also Injun, which is the winner of the Griffin Poetry Prize. Uh, Abel's poems appear in various anthologies, journals, magazines, and uh, his visual poetry has been included in exhibitions at the Polygon Gallery, at the Unit Pit Gallery, the Oslo Pilot Project Room in Oslo, Norway. Uh, I also want to let you know that uh, Jordan also recently completed his PhD at Simon Fraser University, and he works as an assistant professor at the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of Alberta, uh, and that's where he teaches Indigenous literatures and creative writing. So wonderful to have you here. And to guide the conversation today, I'm excited to introduce Billy Ray Belcourt. Uh, Billy Ray is a writer and academic from the Drift Pile Cree Nation, and he won the 2018 Griffin Poetry Prize for his debut book of novel uh, poems, This Wound is a Word. Uh, his second poetry collection, Indian Coping Mechanisms, won the Stefan Stephenson Award for Poetry. And his third book, A Brief History of, of, History of My Brief Body, sorry, is a finalist for the 2020 Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction, which actually the winners will be announced on June 1st. So stay tuned for that. Very soon we'll know if Billy wins the Governor General. Now, Billy Ray earned his PhD in English at the University of Alberta, and he was a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Scholar. So that's it from me. Thanks for being here, both of you. And Billy Ray, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, Jordan. I was just thinking in the brief moment of silence we had uh, before jumping onto this call um, that I, I suspect you and I will be hosting each other's book launches <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> we'll just keep <laughs> alternating. You uh, hosted a discussion with me when NDN Coping Mechanisms came out in 2019 in Edmonton. Um, and uh, that very much is uh, lovely to think about. <laughs> um, I thought I would, I have a number of questions. Um, sure. And I thought I would begin with an easy, easier one, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, um, do you consider yourself um, an archivist? What is your relation to the archive, both as a place, but also as a set of practices and materials that's um, inside and outside institutions yeah that's that's really interesting i uh so in in nishka um you know for those for those of you who who uh haven't haven't had a chance to look at it yet you know there's like it's a it's a book that's um it's published as creative nonfiction, 
uh, but it also contains within it uh, photography and concrete poetry and and many, many different kinds of, of archival documents, including um, photographs and transcriptions of of other other kinds of of, of documents um, that have you know in various ways shaped shaped my life and you know I think even when I look back to my first book which is a book called The Place of Scraps you know that uh, you know that book which is published as as poetry you know also contains um, you know, nonfiction in the form of Marius Barbeau's writing, as well as erasure poetry and photography. Um, you know, so I think whatever whatever it is that I do, you know, I think is deeply invested in 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 the in the archives as a as 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 a source to draw from and a mm. and a and a place to a place to think within. Um, and and also, you know, as as a space in which you know can be uh, can be represented, you know, to 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 readers, you know, to invite them, you know, in. And is there something to be said about going against the grain of Canada's colonial archival practices? You know, for a long time, a lot of this history was buried, um, hidden, and you know, only until recently has there been a kind of collective national effort to uh, to collect and house testimony and other materials, other uh, other documents uh, in in centralized places. Um, what do you what do you make of that and uh, the book's relationship to that? Yeah, you know, I think those, you know, one of the first places that I that I went, you know, when I was really trying to think about write, like writing this book was the official TRC archives for mm -hmm. the Kokpalitsa Indian Residential School. And, you know, the like the the documents that remain there, um, and many of them, you know, um were uh, destroyed over the years for various, for, like for various reasons, uh, through various means, uh, you know. So there are only so many that were um, uh, that are publicly available through through the TR TRC's official archive. Um, so, so my my first my first impulse, you know, was to look through what I what I could find there, mm -hmm. uh, and to see what I could learn. Um, about my grandparents and my grandparents' experience at that particular school. And unfortunately, you know, I couldn't find, you know, anything that related directly to them. And so, you know, I think, you know, part of what Nishka is, you know, is uh, is an alternative to the official archive. You know, there are like it's it's a it's a you know, in, in many ways, you know, it's a it's the repositioning of a personal familial archive, um, and a and a and a, a a making public, you know, of that personal archive, you know, for others to to engage with, you know, in whatever way that makes sense, you know, and the and the way that um, you know, and the way that the book is structured too, you know, I think, you know, invites the kind of archival reading practice, you know, and that sure. um, you're, you're invited to, you know, read a note, you know, that's uh, a creative nonfiction moment from me next to, you know, a more official documents, you know, from the Niska Nation, for example, which is, you know, then followed up, you know, by a photograph, which is then followed up, you know, by um, a quote from the TRC, you know, so I think there's like a way as a reader you're asked to asked to sift through multiple documents and and see everything in in relation um, to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a I think there's a deep generosity to that, and that courses throughout throughout the book, and um, also demonstrates. You know what I say in the blurb <laughs> is your like particular 
methodological flair. And I, I taught engine in my class uh, last, I guess last year now. And what struck both me and my students was the, the conceptual rigor of the project. And I, I think that is very much evident here as well. And by which I mean, there's a deep thoughtfulness, um, which of course problematizes the, the anti-thoughtfulness of colonial memory. Um, you're asking readers to put to use an analytic that isn't institutionally uh, supported or empowered. And that made me think as well about the, there's in one of your talks that you um, reproduce in the book, you gestured to the argument that there are ideas about indigenous life and history that cannot be articulated directly. I think settler publics desire that directness and a kind of lucidity from us that is at times politically bankrupt. And across your books, I think there's a meta discussion happening about modes of storytelling, about the semiotics of race and about the sayable and the unsayable. And I wondered if you could talk about the spaces where those two collide. So I think that's what, that's what Nishka is about. Totally. Totally. Um, you know, I think, you know, I think as, 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 a, as a writer, you know, I sometimes really struggle with, you know, the things that are unsayable and cannot be articulated. Um, and I think, you know, s sometimes, you know, I feel like that's like a, it's like, like a like a, a failing, you know, in some in right. some ways, you know, at that you know there are there are certain things that I I can't speak to, um, and in particular, I think there's like a couple of moments, you know, in this book, uh, you know, where there where there are things that you know I really you know desperately want to say, but you know I can't bring can't bring myself to say mm -hmm. them, um, and that you know my my strategy. Um, in those moments, you know, is to is to find other other genres in, in which to to work with to try to address address the thing that I that I cannot articulate, um, and you know, in this case, you know, like there's um, there two sections I'm thinking of, you know, like the, the the first section, you know, is this long long section of, of photographs that appear one after the other. And that and that particular section I think is one that, you know, I I couldn't I couldn't find another another way to to talk about that um, except through photograph and image. Um, you know, and there's something that happens happens there that, you know, I'm still unable to articulate um, through words. Mm -hmm. And and the other thing is that you know, and maybe this like loops back to loops back to the archive. Um, you know, but you know, this this book as a whole really kind of uh, you know really started to crystallize. You know, when my when my mom gave me this box of archival material that included a lot of photographs of my dad's artwork and a lot of photographs of my parents. And so, you know, when I was going through the process of of trying to trying to uh, talk about intergenerational trauma and you know how I continued to feel uh, the the wake of violence that extends outwards from the Kokoliza Indian Residential School, mm -hmm. it felt important to me to include uh, my dad's artwork um, mm -hmm. as as a way to to try to to not only try to get to know my dad better, you know, through the, the, sh the shapes and contours of his artwork, but also to, um, to position him in, at, like, more fully as, as a person, you know, and as an artist who lived and breathed and existed, you know, um, and, and I, and, 
his work, um, you know, I think was was really incredibly important to me um, in the in the writing of this book uh, because it it allowed me to to have this kind of relationship with him, mm-hmm. um, you know, through his artwork, even though you know our our relationship, you know, as I as I talk about in Nishka, you know, was really you know limited to just mm-hmm. you know this one one point in my life where I where I I, I met him. Um, and so, you know, I think those strategies um, to to uh, a, of of using visual work, I I think to to articulate something that cannot be articulated with words mm-hmm. for me anyway, you know, I think is it was an important one um, in this book to try and you know get all get at all of those nuances and complexities that you know i wasn't i wasn't able to to get through or get to by any other means mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah that's that's really powerful and i um so the images end up being a kind of collaborative work there's i guess your father's uh images and then i'm assuming you're putting the text inside yes yeah Yeah. so there is all like the the all the shapes are my dad's images Mm -hmm. and then the 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 text is is mine and Mm -hmm. the and the photographs are uh the the family archival photographs Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. again i think there's something there about the body being in and of itself a kind of archive the that there are various reasons why we have to write in a plural mode where the i the singularity of the i doesn't quite work and um we require a collective voice yeah i i think you know, I, I think for this book, you know, one of the one of the biggest struggles that I had, you know, and I, I've I've talked about, you know, this this work before is being problem based writing where the problem is intergenerational trauma, uh, is that, you know, when I started to to think about that, you know, like, I, it became very clear very early on that, um, that. You know, I couldn't just tell my my own story. You know that in order to to talk about this at all, it necessarily involved other people. You know, mm-hmm. and it necessarily involved that that plurality. Um, you know, and and you know, for me, it was you know my my parents and and my grandparents. You know, and and then and you know some of those pieces of those stories, and and I think. I think too, you know, there's so much that was left out of Nishka, you know, for for various ethical reasons, and, you know, I think the stuff that I left in that ultimately, you know, forms the shape of this book, you know, I think is is a is about like the the in, the intertwining of of multiple lives, mm-hmm. um, and and how those, um, and and how they you know brush up against each other. Um, you know, and how you know they they can't be you know separated, <laughs> you know, uh, and you know I think that's um, you know I, I think that's such a it's such an important thing for me to you know remember you know as I was you know trying to talk about you know how it was that that colonial violence still lingers with me mm-hmm. you know that it's it's a thing like it's a that violence is a thing that has shifted and transformed through through multiple generations, uh, and you know is um, a, a lived, felt, and embodied thing that you know I that you know still shapes me in mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It makes me think of Dian- Diane Millian's important essay, Felt Theory, which you know in. In, totally. in that in that essay, she's arguing that uh, indigenous women, in particular, had to produce a different kind of language uh, because, in at the time, the dominant discourse around indigenous rights 
was single issue focused. It was just about race. It wasn't about gender and sexuality as well. And so Indigenous women had to begin writing in this more intersectional way in order to capture the particularities of their experience. And because of that, be able to advocate um, for themselves and to ask for a particular kind of historical reckoning that, that at the time um, wasn't in the mainstream. And today, I think what a lot of Indigenous writers are doing, and myself included, I think what you're doing is trying to strike a kind of a, a, a note of like alarm about the ways that the, the violence of the long 20th century continues in sometimes invisible forms. And, it, and I think of, for example, the discussion around in BC, the prioritization of indigenous peoples in the first uh, round of the vaccine rollout. And the, uh, one of the MLAs for one of the North Vancouver constituencies, Bowen Ma, she put out a, a, a press release saying that her office had, be, had been receiving essentially racist letters and emails of complaints about that. And she had to remind people uh, her constituents that indigenous peoples are susceptible, you know, are more susceptible to disease and um, COVID-19 including. And um, we learned recently too in like 2019, I think it was about the, uh, that there's, you know, statistical evidence that indigenous peoples live shorter lives than other Canadians. And I, I keep writing about this because I, there's something so um, frustrating about the way that these statistics can get rattled off without accounting for the enormity of them. <laughs> and it's like the way these things uh, linger in, in an affective way, in a corporeal way that you can't necessarily, you don't always see um, it's like we have to become theorists of of these of these in, you know sometimes invisible or or microscopic or cellular things um, and yeah it makes me think of course of Christina Sharp and her her thinking about uh, the afterlife of slavery alongside to be a Hartman and um, just the, the totality of uh, the ways that structural violence lingers. I don't know where I'm going, really, but I um, I think yeah, your book is about this as well. Um, the the afterlife of of state sanctioned violence. Totally, totally, and you know, I think you know, I I I think you're so right. You know the there's like a certain kind of invisibility, you know, to the, uh, to, to not only indigenous peoples, you know, but, you know, basically every indigenous issue, <laughs> you know, and you're talking about all those, you know, uh, people who sent, you know, those racist letters to that MLA, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's like, you know, unfortunately, like, I think that's like a really common, you know, response, you know, to, almost you know any any yeah. any news item that mentions indigenous peoples at all you know and yeah. and i i think you know i think there's still such like a huge lack of understanding of of indi like indigenous life <laughs> you know and uh and indigenous um history in canada like and even having to call it like indigenous history you know i think is you know frustrating sometimes you know because it's also canadian history <laughs> mm -hmm. you know um but you know i think you know for this for this project you know the thing that i i feel like i i struggled with so greatly you know was just shining a light on what's 
um, on what it meant to be an intergenerational survivor of residential mm -hmm. schools and just trying to explain what that experience even looked like um, mm -hmm. to, to other people. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I think I, I, I mean, I, I try to, um, you know, recognize this, you know, throughout the book, you know, but I, I just have, you know, one particular experience, you know, and, um, and, and, and one, one way of, of, of knowing um, and that, you know, other people, you know, may have, may have other experiences or may have experienced things differently. Um, but I'm also, you know, so surprised sometimes, you know, uh, or, you know, even, even in this, the, the short time that this book has been out and, and circulating is that, you know, so many people have so many people have reached out to say that you know they've had really similar experiences mm -hmm. you know or their experiences overlap and that you know these aren't things that you know i think we talk about enough you know like especially you know for me like we don't we don't talk about what it means to be um what it means to be indigenous but to be severed from your community you right. know we don't talk about what it means to be uh indigenous but to be uh but to be dispossessed of in indigenous knowledge and indigenous language, you mm -hmm. know, I think you know, those are those are things that you know for whatever reason you know always slide under the radar, or mm -hmm. always you know invisible somehow. And mm -hmm. and I think you know, I, I, you know, in my mind anyway, you know, I think you know we have to you know find ways to enact care for those communities, you know, who uh who who are who are dispossessed you know uh, obviously like by no fault of their own you know mm -hmm. just by way of colonial violence and mm -hmm. you know and you know i think um you know like radical forms of care are, are needed mm -hmm. um you know and and you know i, I think that's it, that to me anyway is you know one of the the driving driving forces of you know what what sparked this work in the in the first place mm -hmm. have there been other texts with which you have thought about this particular narrative or are there you know i think you're right in saying that there are so few i mean i i would i definitely think um, you know, there's like, there's a, there's a few books that I, I mentioned in Nishka as being ones that, you know, I, I see as like attempting to address some of the subject matter, you know, and I think about uh, Eden Robinson's book, Monkey Beach, and um, Jeff Barnaby's film, Rhyme and Sri mm -hmm. and uh, Lisa Bird Wilson's book, uh, The Red Files, and, you know, I think there, I think there are, are lots, lots more too. You know that that attempt to somehow, you know, address the the afterlife of residential schools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even if they don't articulate it, you know, in those right. moments. Right. And you know, like Monkey Beach is one of the one of the books that you know it doesn't you know speak outright. <laughs> you know that this is that um, that residential schools you know form you know the the backbone of some of the story there. Um, which is the thing that uh, Sam McKegney talks about in his book, Magic Weapons. Um, you know, but I, but to me, to me, I think, you know, those, those works and, you know, others are, are absolutely worth uh, reading and seeking out since, you know, um, and especially for, for those, you know, who, you know, haven't, haven't had a chance to to read too much in that area, you know. I think, um, you know, and I mean, I guess maybe this is, is the part where I say, you know, everyone should read all of the books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> every every book is to be read, <laughs> and then we can come back and 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 talk about them all. Right. <laughs> I do have another question about genre <laughs> and I get this one a lot and I don't always feel inspired by it, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, it is one that matters and that one that we consider 
because the book Nishka feels to me like an art book, both in its design and its composition, the inside of the book and the outside of it. Um, and I guess I just wanted you to talk a bit about genre and what your relation to it and um, the kind of like, genre defiance that, I, that characterizes your writing. Yeah, I, um, you know, it used to be that I was completely in love with poetry because mm -hmm. I imagined it to be a space where, um, you know, multi-genre work could could exist uh, and and flourish. You know, in part because nobody was really you know shining shining a light on it. There, you know, there's no no poetry police, uh, <laughs> you know, saying that you know your book of poetry needs to be something that it isn't you know and so you know when i think about uh you know my book uh engine and my book uninhabited which are both you know drawn from this uh corpus of, of western novels mm -hmm. you know both of the both of those books are published as poetry but are actually somewhere at the intersection between fiction and poetry um and and i i think that's um you know that that like that was a really productive space for me to be in artistically uh, and um, and you know I think with with Nishka you know I think like I you know those the the way that uh, photography and concrete poetry and creative nonfiction and and academic writing you know kind of come together you know I think is is really you know uh, exciting for me, you know, as as a as a writer, um, and you know, I feel uh, I feel you know lifted up by the possibilities, you know, that could happen with mm -hmm. with like multi genre work, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think you know, I think um, you know, I, I think some of my my favorite work too, you know, that I that I read, you know, tends to be like tends to be multi multi genre work too like a, like even thinking about uh this wound is a world or andean coping mechanisms like you know those books strike me as you know both being works of poetry but also works of critical theory mm -hmm. and in and andean coping mechanisms you know also photography you know so like i i, I feel like I, I feel like there's like a like a space there, you know, that yeah. I, I want to hang out in. <laughs> yeah. That I feel like it, that's really productive, you know, mm -hmm. as as a writer. And, you know, I, I think I think, <laughs> you know, you like that's that's a space you're into as well. I think the the content, the subject matter necessitates a mode of, of, of writing or creativity that Go, you know, goes outside any bounds of genre. I mean, there, um, yeah, to try to cut through the like, cacophony of injurious ideas, um, but also to, I think, really like shore up particular kind of emotional orientation to the material um, that is less about asking someone to step into one our shoes, so to speak, and more about um, bearing witness and um, seeing or glimpsing the scale and the scope um of the of the the history of how it continues um yeah then, yeah sorry go on oh <laughs> um yeah i was just i was just thinking about that and you know i think thinking about the the kinds the kinds of work um that's that that we do and and also thinking about how, 
what it what it means to sometimes do them you know in, from from within the university mm -hmm. um and and to exist exist in that in that space uh and i and i know you know for me i think like nishka you know was my phd dissertation and mm -hmm. you know i think do like and writing writing the book you know i think in that context you know really like shapes parts of it you know I, and and you know i think also provided some much needed deadlines <laughs> you know <laughs> that i yeah. might not have had you know if i wasn't you know doing it doing it that way mm -hmm. you know um but also provided you know so many so many challenges i think you know to to you know, to to try to to try to like even in you know trying to justify the existence you know of that of that mm -hmm. work and you know what it what it was doing or or how how it was doing it you know and and um you know it, you know for for those of you who have you know seen the book you know like it there are there there are transcripts of of academic talks that that appear through throughout it you know that i thought um you know we're all like I, I when i say academic talks i i, I mean they happened you know at a conference right. <laughs> you know i i don't know if they're actually you know the the kind of talks that academics usually give you know but uh i i, I snuck into those spaces and you know recorded them um and now they're they're in the book um and you know one of the questions that you know i think you know, I've always, you know, wanted 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 to to ask like to ask you, and also to have you know in conversation with you. It's just like about what it means to 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 do this kind of work, um, you know, in 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 spaces, you know, where the where that work doesn't seem to to belong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think likewise with my uh, doctoral project, um, which also became my most recent book, um, it was, I had to allow myself not to want to reproduce disciplinary norms. I wasn't doing a, an English dissertation or a literary studies dissertation um, and to, to be to be able to utilize various methodological approaches from both inside and outside the academy, um, again in the service in the service of not the discipline but the the material the subject matter, um, and myself I think there's also that, um, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, after after reading um, a, a history of my my brief body, like I thought it was, you know, such such an amazing, you know, beautiful, like compelling work that you know seemed to um, defy, you know, everything that I had been told a dissertation was supposed to be. <laughs> and, you know, and that, you know, I found, you know, incredibly uplifting. <laughs> um, you know, and I think, uh, yeah, you know, and I, I, I think it's, I think it's really amazing sometimes, um, you know, what, what happens, you know, when we, you know, have this time and space sometimes to create these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, on a different note, I don't want to put you on the spot, but, um, did you want to read at all from the book? Sure. We've been talking sure. about it so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, a, um, a, a sure. So, uh, if, if it's cool with everyone, uh, the, uh, the part I'd actually really like to read from, uh, and if you've, uh, if you've seen the book there, are all of these images throughout, uh, through throughout, um, you know, where my my dad's art, um, 
you know, provides the provides the shape, and then within that, uh, within those shapes, there's there's bits of photography and also um, bits of text, and and the text uh, in those particular moments is uh, is really difficult to read, <laughs> uh, but there's one moment where it comes up uh, really close to the end, and and I think. Um, I, I think that's the that's the space I'd really like to to read from. It was from a project called Empty Spaces. A deep, narrow chasm, black rocks. The river lies still on those black rocks. A mile above there is a tumbling. There is a moment. At this very moment, there is a tumbling in the air a mile above us that runs straight through the open heavens and into some other place. A deep hollow, no shape, no consistency, no breaking some hundred feet in the air. Some places are softer than others, some hundred feet up in the air. Some right angles enter into narrow passageways and some right angles break off a mile in the air above us. These rocks are full of cracks. Water has worked through some deep hollows, breaking here, wearing there, breaking and wearing until the chasm separates into two caverns. Some hundred feet in the air, there is no danger. There is scattered driftwood and the scent of roses. There are glimpses of roses and rocks and shrubs. There is a steep, rugged ascent, a path that winds among the black rocks and trees. Somewhere in the air, there is the scent of roses. Somewhere out there is the wilderness, a reasonable distance through scenes of greenery and nature and glimpses of mountain ranges that disappear just as suddenly as they appear. Among the rocks and trees, there are mounds of earth and other rocks and other driftwood. Somewhere there is an islet and another islet and a clear sheet of water and bald rocks just beneath the surface. There are forests and straits and islets and rocks and somewhere in the air is the scent of roses. There are crevices and fissures and rocks. The rocks surround themselves and other rocks although there are sometimes mounds of earth in between. On the shore, there are fragments of rocks. In the deeper parts of the river, there is more tumbling. At this very moment, the river pours into a wide fissure where it just becomes more water between rocks. Between the broken rocks and the deep roaring cavern, there is a scent of roses and driftwood and trees. There is light and straight naked rocks and immovable trees. There are woods and rivers, and the bed of that river is ragged with rocks and intersecting ravines that cut silently across the water above, where somewhere in the air is the scent of roses. The woods are full of sounds and rocks and trees. The woods are full. The upper air, where it drifts over the tops of trees, is full of sounds. Just where it breaks over the tops of trees, there are slow intermingling drifts of sounds and scents that brush over the clearing some 50 or 60 feet up in the air. Rocks and logs and mounds of earth and narrow fissures and bottomland and little ponds and a brook that shoots through the narrow fissures, spreading through moments after moments of stretched light. There is a bellowing in the passageways between the rocks. There are moments of admonished madness. There are moments spreading over the acres of bottom lands. There are precipices and adjacent lakes and headwaters. There is a fierceness here that floats through the waters. These rivers are full to the brim. These waters stream down to our feet. In six hours, these waters will rush in. And in another six hours, these waters will rush out. Salt grows in this water, the water in the woods and on the Great Lakes and in the higher parts of the sea, stretching out horizontally until the current flows upward like blood at the throat. On these waters, the edges touch the shores and the deer paths trace back to the streams. 
In the short distance in between the water and the black rocks is a deep shadow. The breath of the stream, the glancing waters, the throat of the river, these woods are full. Gliding above, somewhere up in the impenetrable darkness is the scent of roses. Somewhere there is the sound of rushing waters ringing through the deep stillness of the night. The moon rises and the light glances here and there on the water and down to the riverbed. At times, the light hangs in the air on the breath of the river. There are dark waters, there is night. This is the unmingled sweetness of air that sinks into the foaming waters. These are the vaults of forest. There is the stillness here somewhere in the wilderness. There is lightning and then there is stillness. There are echoes that rush through the forest until they disappear. A mile above there is a tumbling. In the foaming waters there is the color of blood gushed from some other place, some other throats some other softer place. Some waters carry the dead. Somewhere up in the air is the scent of roses. Some flames last forever. Some waters thicken with limbs and bodies and trembling voices. Some waters are still. Somewhere in the velocity of the uproar, there is a current of air, an unmingled sweetness that sinks into the forest. The narrow path adjacent to the brook is full of bodies. The blood is natural as water. Glassy mirrors, the sunken hillsides, the shores, the black rocks between the mounds of earth, the glittering stars, the open air floating over the forest. In the valley, the stream overflows onto the banks. Here, the tumbling water washes bones and the waters of the river go into the salt lake. There is a canopy from the woods spreading over the lake, shadowing a dark current with a deep hue. When the sun is setting, these waters become healing waters, but the sun is not setting and the current branches silently into the dark parts of the lake. Somewhere in the forest, bark is peeled from a tree. Branches break. For many minutes, there is a struggle and a deep, cool wind. There is a current of air. There is silent motion plunging and glancing and sweeping over the broken branches. The sound from the rushing waters drifts through the air. There are words and yells and cries as the air flows up from somewhere in the deep, narrow ravine. There is silence again, with the exception of the sounds that come from the rushing water. And I will I will, I will pause there. <laughs> this is uh, this is actually a project that is is grown considerably since I since I, I started it, and it is now um, thousands and thousands of of words of descriptions of land. <laughs> so I I I will I would bore you all to tears. I think <laughs> if I if I kept going. <laughs> Uh, but th thank you for for uh, giving giving me a moment to to share that that part of the book with you. Well, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I suppose we could um, end here, <laughs> unless there's anything more you'd like to say about the book. No, I think uh, I I think this has been wonderful. Th th thank you so much for for all of your amazing questions, Billy Ray, and uh, thank you all so much for being here and for going to Massey Books to to buy your books. <laughs> uh, I can't remember if Jorge should we invite you back. I'm here. I'm here. Amazing. Can you hear me? I switched computers, as you could probably tell, different room this time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I heard that it, I was freezing on the other one. Um, thank you, both of you, for, for this. It's just beautiful. Um, I know the audience is enjoying it as well. You can see the, all the amazing comments in the chat. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to remind the audience and both of you, if uh, if anyone wants to watch the event again uh, or want to wants to share it with your friends, it's being live streamed as we speak to the Facebook page of the library, so you can find it there. Um, 
they'll be there archived for the foreseeable future until Facebook turns down. Um, I also want to again remind everyone that Massey Books is the partner for this event. So please remember that they're offering a 10% discount if you buy the book from now until June 1st. And um, I also would love it if people want to give us feedback about this event as a public institution. Our job is to do programs that work for, for you, the audience. And so your feedback is very important. So we keep getting better and better at this. So um, we're going to share a link to a form in the chat. I promise that um, your replies will not go to a dark hole of the internet where no one sees them. We actually look at them every week and make sure that we uh, adapt our programming and take your uh, so, you know, your feedback into consideration always. Um, so it'll take a minute to fill it out. So please don't be discouraged by the idea that it's just a survey on the internet. Um, and so before we end, before I let everyone go, um, two quick events that I want to tell you about that are coming up. Uh, on Tuesday uh, at lunchtime, we're hosting a conversation with, sorry, Thursday at lunchtime with Toronto writer Michael Lapointe. Uh, about his new novel, The Creep, and he's going to be chatting with local writer and UBC prof Kevin Chong. So we're going to put a link in the chat. And then on June 9th, uh, we're hosting a conversation about the history of Indigenous comedy with com comedy historian Cliff Nesteroff, who's considered the human encyclopedia of comedy. And he's going to be on stage chatting with uh, Dakota Hebert and with Ryan McMahon, who I know many of you know as the host of the popular podcast Thunder Bay. So come see Ryan McMahon, Dakota Hebert, and Cliff Nesteroff uh, on June 9th. And that's all I got for today. Thank you, both of you, for being here. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for this lunchtime event. And um, yeah, have a great time. We're going to get off the stage, all of us. And in the meantime, the event's going to be on for about another five minutes because there's a bunch of links that I imagine people want to click through and leave as tabs open forever on your browser. So. Uh, I'm going to say goodbye now, but um, this is going to stay open for about five minutes. Thank you all for joining us and hope to see you at the next event. Goodbye.